Male desert tortoises fight to establish their position in society. A rival male provokes noisy, violent behavior, quite out of character with the tortoise's usual placid progression from plant to plant. The rivals butt each other in an attempt to establish dominance and nod their heads as a threatening signal. They try to bite each other, but rarely draw blood. A tortoise might flip a rival onto his back, but then inadvertently help him to regain his feet by repeated ramming. If the tortoises are evenly matched, these encounters can go on and on. These contestants are not equals. It's not long before the smaller tortoise retreats with as much speed and dignity as he can muster. It's time they both looked for shelter. The sun is climbing high. It won't be long before the ground is too hot to touch, even for those scaly feet. For a soft-bodied caterpillar, Morning in the Mojave Desert is a race against the sun. A few extra minutes of exposure will mean certain death. It digs a burrow and sits out the middle of the burning desert day under the sand. In warm weather, most of the animals can survive only by seeking shelter. here you might get the impression that <clears throat> there's not much here that could be damaged by off-road driving or other kinds of human activities but in actual fact vehicular activity in a place like this can be seriously damaged if it's chronic people use the area extensively and that comes about because the bushes get broken down the crust that guards the desert against blowing dust gets broken Animal burrows are crushed. Some animals are killed right on the spot. Some people have the idea, well, the animals can just go somewhere else, but that usually doesn't happen. If they do go somewhere else, those areas are usually occupied and the animal is lost and has trouble finding uh, food and shelter. So a heavy impact in an area like this can be seriously damaging to the living system. The human population explosion in the desert southwest of the United States has created a hunger for space and resources. It's fun to be free, and open spaces have always challenged the human spirit. But the damage to some parts of the Mojave has been devastating. These riders are within their designated area, but far too many others ignore the boundaries and tear across the fragile desert. Already over 40,000 kilometers of roads and tracks scar the Mojave. Because of increasing human damage, there is a demand for parts of California's desert to be given national park status. Until now, damage by vehicles has been largely overlooked in the excitement and the challenge of man and machine against nature.
The noise damages the hearing of lizards and rodents, destroying their defenses against predators. Spinning tires grind up plants and crush animals in their burrows. The dust blows in the desert wind. The damage to the desert will last for years, even decades. Some areas may never recover. The dunes of the Mojave cannot survive as racetracks. They're more than beautiful wind-sculptured piles of sand. They support a complex and highly adapted population of plants and animals, and it's certain that more species remain to be discovered. The birdcage evening primrose flourishes where few other plants can survive by sending down long roots into deep layers of moist sand. The larvae of the sphinx moth live on the dunes chiefly because of the evening primroses. Having taken food and moisture from the flowers, they retreat underground not to avoid the heat, but to pupate. This larva will reappear as an adult moth. The dune cricket has bristles on its hind legs that enabled it to shovel out sand in large quantities. The fringe-toed lizard has specially shaped scales along its toes to give it a grip on the loose surface. Like all desert inhabitants, it needs to avoid the desiccating sun and wind. It swims beneath the sand like an eel moving through soft mud. The most extraordinary method of traveling over loose sand is used by the sidewinder, a type of rattlesnake. It seems to skip over the dune, leaving a distinctive sinuous track. Most other snakes have difficulty in negotiating a dune. The sidewinder has found a way to do it at great speed. It moves freely on one of the desert's most difficult terrains with an elegance in harmony with the spirit of the Mojave. When rain sweeps across the desert, it's often sudden, brief, and violent. On average, only five centimeters of rain a year falls in the Mojave. In some years, none comes at all. Water triggers seeds that may have lain dormant in the soil for 30 years. Generous rains in late autumn bring an explosion of color to the desert. Such an opulent flowering of poppies, dandelions and lupins is seen about once in 20 years. The desert tortoise takes full advantage of the sudden glut of food 
a brief respite from its usual drier diet. Gorging on desert dandelions will enable it to build up enough fat and water to see it through the next few months. Other plants come into bloom. This ocotillo will flower at any time of the year if it gets enough moisture. The spikes are not cactus spines, but the sharp stalks left after the green leaves fall. A cactus wren defends its territory in the desert spring among the flowering thorns of the ocotillo. Hummingbirds and butterflies drink the nectar from the ocotillo's tubular flowers. The hummingbird's beak is long and fine and reaches deep into the heart of the flower. The verdin, a type of bush tit, has no such probing beak. It must make a small hole near the base of the flower to get to the nectar. This leaves the hummingbird with a choice of two entrances to the ocotillo's heart. The succulent green shoots and the blazing flowers vanish almost as quickly as they appeared. Life in the desert soon returns to dry normality. Nighttime in the Mojave isn't all hunters and hunted. As the shadows lengthen once again across the dunes, a kangaroo rat stirs from its daytime slumber. After carefully grooming its fine tail, it's ready for the night's activity. First, it eats the seeds stored in its entrance burrow. They've absorbed water vapor from the kangaroo rat's breath as it slept. By eating them, it recycles most of the moisture lost during its day of sleep. It's so well adapted to the desert that it never needs to drink water. Once outside in the moonlight, the kangaroo rat will rely on its speed and agility to escape predators, principally owls and coyotes. Kangaroo rats are highly territorial. They chase away any intruder from the entrance to the burrow. They must keep a careful guard over their store of seeds. A full larder may mean the difference between life and death. In the Joshua tree above the kangaroo rat's burrow, on this desert evening, there's a remarkable demonstration of the interdependence between plants and animals. Inside the flowers, which opened in response to the rain, there lives a moth found nowhere else on earth. The female Joshua tree yucca moth cannot feed, but she collects pollen in her specially adapted mouth. She then carries it to a different flower, which she fertilizes. Unlike insects that eat pollen, she gets no food from the transaction. With her long tubular ovipositor, she injects her eggs into a flower's developing ovary. Safe inside, the eggs will hatch into larvae with a built-in food supply. Enough moth-fertilized seeds will remain uneaten to ensure new generations of Joshua trees. This tiny moth maintains the distinctive scenery of the Mojave Desert. The ripening pods will soon shed their seed and the Joshua tree may not bloom again until it rains, perhaps the following year or even several years later. 
In the Choya cactus, where the roadrunners nested, their clutch is growing well, flourishing on the bounty of insects and small animals brought by the rain. A roadrunner's diet is mainly lizards and snakes. Most carnivorous animals of the desert eat lizards, a plentiful source of both protein and moisture. The chicks are now about two weeks old, still ungainly and only partly feathered. As they grow, their parents feed them with larger lizards and anything else they can catch. Ground squirrels are the prey of most desert predators large enough to catch them, even roadrunners. The eggs hatch in the order in which they're laid. The older chicks can manage larger food, but even so, a half-grown ground squirrel is the biggest prey they can eat. If suitable food is in short supply, the younger chicks will be eaten by their parents or by their elders in the desert's harsh provision for survival. Most of the Mojave is brought to life, however rarely, by brief rains. But there are places where no amount of water can awaken flowers. In the northern part of the desert is a salty, desiccated basin aptly named Death Valley. It's a menacing place where temperatures often exceed 50 degrees centigrade. The cracked ground has a scaly appearance like the skin of an ancient reptile. Several thousand years ago, this was a huge lake. Dotted around the valley floor, a handful of tiny springs still produce water, intensely salty and bitter to the taste. In one of these little pools, a water pipit hunts for brine flies. Surprisingly, many of the pools have fish in them. These desert pupfish are among the rarest animals in the world. Some species have already become extinct as their pools have dried up. The fish can survive temperatures of over 37 degrees in water six times saltier than the sea. Underground streams bubble up into some of the pools. The best known pupfish, which is protected as an endangered species, is found only at Devil's Hole. Pumping for irrigation has depleted the subterranean reservoirs that feed the hole, so that the water surface is now far below ground level and shaded for most of the day. Because the rock walls crumble as they dry out, the original level can never be restored. So little light now reaches the water that the algae that the fish eat hardly grow. Owls that roost above the hole drop their pellets into the water, providing the pupfish with almost their only source of food. As in all deserts, water is the key to survival in the Mojave. The tiny amount that glittered on the surface lured cattlemen to introduce grazing stock into this profoundly unsuitable environment. Wild grazing animals can't compete with cattle for food. They've been displaced, pushed into remote corners of the desert that domestic animals can't reach. Eventually, they can no longer move on. There's nowhere else to go. 
desert bighorns gather during the summer around the few remaining permanent sources of water. Unlike their close relations high in the Rocky Mountains, these desert dwellers rarely clash horns, as if conditions here were too severe for such a waste of energy. Like the desert tortoise, the bighorn obtains its water from plants. It needs to drink only during the breeding season. These wild sheep eat very little of any one plant, wandering the desert and browsing lightly as they move. Domestic stock eat plants down to the ground and trample the roots, producing bare soil which can easily become eroded. Donkeys left to run wild by early prospectors are as destructive as domestic cattle, eating and trampling vegetation, fouling water holes, and driving away the shy bighorns. They're remarkably resilient, and even this lame foal will probably survive. Humans continue to make their mark all over the Mojave. Today's boom in mining is much greater than it was in the 19th century. 17 tons of ore have to be crushed to get 30 grams of gold, leaving huge pits and tall spoil heaps. The search for hidden riches is a recurring refrain in the desert. Today, people usually try to adapt the desert to suit them rather than adapting themselves to the desert. People can have green lawns and gushing fountains in the Mojave, but the price is a tremendous drain on the desert's dwindling supply of water. The lawns here are the flamboyant outward sign of a population subjecting a scarce resource to a demand that will be impossible to sustain. Where the watering stops, the desert abruptly begins again. And so does its wildlife. The roadrunner's chicks, now out of the nest, pester their parents for food. They're already almost fully grown. Within a few weeks they'll be completely independent, once they've learned to catch their own food. At this stage the parents hunt within sight of the chicks so that they can watch and learn how to do it. Another native bird is succeeding all too well as the human population grows in the desert. The number of ravens has increased in response to the new food supply, and so has the damage they cause to other wildlife. There are ravens now building up in numbers. We don't know what they're doing to the uh, lizard and snake populations. We know they are severely impacting the tortoise by killing baby tortoises. Raven nests are full of tiny empty tortoise shells. 
In some areas, all the baby tortoises seem to have been killed. People see ravens go over. They're a natural part of the system out here, but their numbers have increased so greatly because of human garbage uh, in the desert, they are creating a very severe impact. Uh, the numbers are just way above what the desert, I think, can tolerate. While ravens increased 15-fold in 20 years, the tortoise population here was halved. If the ancient reptiles are to survive, there will have to be some control over the number of ravens. The tortoise is a good indicator, I think, of what's happening, because the tortoise is in serious trouble now, particularly in the western desert. And I look upon the tortoise as telling us that the general ecosystem as a whole is going downhill fast. These rival male tortoises face a more immediate threat from each other. Once on its back, the loser will quickly perish in the sun unless it can right itself. The close contact involved in fighting spreads a respiratory disease against which the tortoises now seem to have little defense. A weakening of their immune systems may be another sign of the deterioration of this part of the desert. The decline of the tortoise population has had an unexpected effect on a completely unrelated species. Burrowing owls use old tortoise burrows for their nest sites. With fewer tortoises, there are fewer old burrows. The female waits at the entrance while her mate brings her food as a courtship gesture. Dune crickets, grasshoppers and other insects. These small owls are efficient hunters. They stamp on insects or snatch them in their talons in flight. This burrow will serve for this year, but next year the pair may be hard pressed to find a home for their chicks. Among the exploitable assets of the Mojave is an endless supply of sunshine. It could help to solve humanity's pressing energy requirements now and in the future. In principle, solar power is safe and non-polluting. The reflectors concentrate the sun's rays to boil water. The steam drives turbines that produce electricity. But significantly to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, a great deal of the surviving wilderness would have to be disturbed and destroyed. It's a renewable source of energy, but ultimately crude and destructive. The self-renewing system of the surrounding desert is subtler and much more successful, but it's taken many thousands of years to evolve. The phenopepler, with red eyes and a handsome black crest, is a flycatcher. But while they're in season, it feeds almost exclusively on the berries of the parasitic mistletoe that hangs in the desert mesquite trees. It gathers them to feed its chicks, producing them from its crop in an apparently endless stream, like a magician performing a conjuring trick. It seems impossible that either the parent or the chicks could contain this number of berries.
Each berry contains a large sticky seed that passes intact through the bird's digestive system. The adults leave their droppings in mesquite trees where the seeds stick to the bark. When they sprout, they send a parasitic root into the wood of the host tree. The phenopepla, in effect, plants its own vegetable garden. Like many other pairs of species in the desert, the bird and the mistletoe depend on each other. I sometimes wonder why I am so driven <laughs> to uh, work toward the protection of natural living systems. I think that it's simply because I have such a tremendous feeling, a real reverence for life, uh, the living system, and I know many people so enjoy nature and many more are coming to enjoy nature. I think about people now and far into the future. We just must not trash this wonderful planet. Recognizing the value of the Earth's remaining wild places is a relatively recent phenomenon. Today, there is growing pressure to give national park status to the surviving unspoiled areas of the Mojave and to give lesser protection to much more of the desert. The challenge is to find a balance between the demands of 35 million people in the growing cities of the American Southwest and the needs of the desert. Those needs are now more clearly understood. It's a complex and fragile system whose survival as a wilderness depends on vast areas being left alone with no impact from humanity. By its very existence, the desert adds something to the human spirit. <laughs>